My dearly beloved in Christ, if today's gospel is familiar, there is a good reason for that, and that is that we read this gospel twice, or this story of the marriage feast, once by St. Matthew, today on the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and the other is on the second Sunday after Pentecost, so about four months ago, from the Gospel of St. Luke. And they both tell basically the same story, but we, but they're different details. And so we find that our Lord told this on two separate occasions, at least two. And there may have been other times. In fact, it would seem that our Lord, who spoke so much to crowds as he traveled throughout Palestine, must have used certain parables over and over, and again, maybe adding different details. So in today's Gospel, the 22nd of chapter of St. Matthew, we find that a king prepared a banquet, a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out invitations, and those invited did not come. And then he sent out other servants to invite those that were invited, to urge them to come in. And it says one went to his farm, another went to his business, and the others treated his servants shamefully and killed them. Now, there are a number of applications of this parable, but one of them is of the Jewish people, because they were invited by their prophets. And they should have recognized our Lord when he came if they faithfully read the prophecies. Because all the prophets of the Old Testament pointed to our Lord and so clearly pointed him out that he should have been recognized by the people at that time. And our Lord spoke about the forefathers of the Pharisees and he said that they put to death the prophets. Not all the prophets were put to death, but many of them were because the people didn't like being told that they had to amend their lives, that they had to change. And so there is a clear analogy in today's gospel of these servants being put to death as the prophets being put to death. Now let me read just a short section here from a commentary on this gospel. And it says, First, the king is God the Father. The son of the king, the bridegroom, is God's incarnate son, Jesus Christ, whose spouse is the church. Their nuptials were begun in the incarnation of Christ, for in it Christ espoused human nature to himself hypostatically, and thereby the church, that is, all faithful people, to be his spouse mystically by grace. But in heaven, these nuptials shall be consummated with glory. Origen says, by marriage, understand the union of Christ with the soul, and by childbearing and offspring, good works. Now, referring back to the gospel, so... The food has been prepared. There is this great banquet, and yet the guests that were invited did not come. So now the king sends out other servants, and he says, go out into the crossroads and bring in anyone you can find so that my marriage feast will be filled with guests. My banquet will be filled. And it says the servants went out and they brought in anyone they could find, both good and bad. Now that's a very interesting statement. They brought in both good and bad. And it indicates to us that as members of Christ's church, there are all kinds of people. And even though the church is a divine institution, it is made up of human beings. And so therefore there are those Catholics who fail to measure up to the high calling of becoming members of Christ's mystical body. But they still are members of his church on this earth. It reminds us of another parable where our Lord talked about the net lowered into the sea and gathering in the fish 
And after they bring it to the shore, the fishermen sort the good from the bad. They keep the good, the bad they throw away. So likewise in the church, there are good members who are conscientiously striving to live according to the teachings of Holy Mother Church, but then there are those who do not measure up to their high calling as followers of Christ, as members of his mystical body. So the servants go out and they bring in everyone they can find, both good and bad, so that the marriage feast is filled with guests. But then the king wants to go and visit with the guests. And as he's walking among them, he sees a man who does not have on a wedding garment. And he says, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And that reminds us that when a soul stands before Almighty God to be judged, one who is in the state of mortal sin will have no excuse. And he will be speechless because he will have nothing to say. He will have willfully and of his own free will and his own fault failed to cooperate with God's grace and failed to persevere in the state of grace. And of course, that is what the wedding garment signifies, the state of sanctifying grace. The state of sanctifying grace, of course, is essential. And when we come to the end of our lives, we are called out of this world, we stand before our Lord to be judged. The judgment really will boil down to this. Are we in the state of sanctifying grace at that moment or not? So our whole purpose in life should be to put on the wedding garment and to keep it, to not allow it to be soiled or lost, to maintain the state of sanctifying grace, because that is what our eternity will depend upon. St. Augustine says something very interesting that is applicable to today's gospel. He says, you should often go down to hell in your thoughts so that you will never have to go down to hell in reality. In other words, if we often meditate upon hell and the last things, then we will live a good life and will save our immortal souls and will not have to fear going into hell in reality. Notice what our Lord says at the conclusion of this gospel. This man that did not have the wedding garments, the king told his servants, bind his hands and his feet and cast him out into the exterior darkness where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. An interesting description of eternal perdition. There will be that torment, that regret, that worm that gnaws and will never be satisfied of realizing each damned soul, realizing it is through his own fault that he was lost. And he can blame no one else that no one will be lost who is not personally guilty who has not, of his own free will, chosen evil over God. And so there is the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And our Lord then concludes by saying, For many are called, but few are chosen. We must strive to be among the chosen. In fact, a number of spiritual writers speak about the number of the elect. In other words, the number of those saved. Sadly, it appears to be small. When our Lord was asked on one occasion by the disciples, Lord, are few saved? He answered by saying, Strive to enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the path and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go that way. How narrow the gate and straight the way that leads to life, and few there are who find it. And so based on these words, the saints, the spiritual writers, theologians tell us that the vast number of human beings are lost. Not because God did not give them all the graces they needed, but through a perversion of their own free will, choosing evil, 
So that is something that ought to cause us to tremble. To realize that many are called, but few are chosen. And let us strive to live in such a way that we will be found among the few that are chosen. That we will achieve our salvation because we will have used the graces God gives us to persevere in maintaining the wedding garment of sanctifying grace. And that we will do what St. Augustine says. That we will often in this life go down to hell in our thoughts by thinking of what hell is, the reality of it. And if we do that, we will live in such a way that we will never have to go down there in reality. These are the lessons of today's gospel. Let us take them to heart and work out our salvation. As St. Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.